Hello, and welcome to the second episode of Shattered Lives Q&A pods. The first one uh, we did was really, really excellent, and we're hoping the rest of the questions will be just as good. I'm joined as ever by Paul Healy. Hello, Paul. Hello. So we, we, we got through a couple of good questions in the first pod, and we're going to start off with a really good question from yourself, or read out by yourself. Yeah, a uh, person asks us, how fucked is journalism? I don't think it's fucked at all. Um, I So I, I, I'm in my 31st year of being a crime reporter. I remember 2012, right? People would say to me, you know, papers, they've only got five years left, right? Mm -hmm. That was 12 years ago. And every couple of years, it was the same thing. You've only got five years left. You've only got five years left. The thing is, there will be a coming time when print is no more. I know another news group, uh, is, it, is it 2030 that they're going to stop printing all their titles and it's going to go fully online? Journalism mm -hmm. is not just about newspapers. It's not just about print. It's about getting access, getting news, distilling it and putting it out in the public domain. And there are various ways that you can make money from that. Reach, who owns the mirror and the star, don't charge for things. And I, I actually, uh, somebody said that if the mirror and the star, mirror, say the mirror online, starts charging, where are people going to get their news from if they don't want to pay? And I thought that was a really, really strong argument. The Guardian doesn't charge. You can make a donation to the Guardian, no problem. The Irish Times charges, the Irish Independent charges. And really, it's about what get, washing your face, whatever brings in the revenue to keep the journalism going. So, look, I'm 53, 53 now, I'm 54 in a wee while. I will still be a journalist when I'm in my 60s. What do you think, Healy? You've got <clears> more <throat> of the skin in the game, really. I'm closer to the end game than you are. What, what are your thoughts? I agree with a lot of what you're saying, but I, I, I do think... Uh certain elements of journalism is fucked. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I choose to be optimistic about uh, people such as myself or other journalists who are in a specialty field where I feel, although we're in a shrinking market, our, I feel, I hope that our, our skills, our expertise, our ability to do the job, it will be more sought after. And so from a personal selfish perspective, I tr I'm i trying to choose to be optimistic about my career because I think that, um, you know, there will be a need for a crime journalist or, you know, there'll be a need for a political journalist. So, yes, I think that element of it will survive, albeit through different mediums. So, you know, yeah, newspapers are eventually going to die a death. Um, but, you know, I think people, it's already, there's already evidence to show that people will pay for good quality journalism online. And also the, the market for, um, podcasts is huge. I mean, mm -hmm. the, I, the amount of people that uh, this Q and A is proof alone that people want this type of content and are interested in it. So yeah, I, the medium will change. But I think there will still be a need for it. Now, if I, if we had this kind of discussed this on the previous pod. If I was a young journalist, I would really feel that I was fucked um, mm -hmm. because I, I think it's a very challenging environment now to come into, um, uh, you know, to start a, a job in and to earn a living. The, the pay isn't particularly great when you start. And a lot of journalists end up in online clickbait journalism and mm -hmm. uh, they don't really have to pick up the phones nor are they encouraged to do so i'm speaking generally here and so that form of journalism is dying a very slow and painful death i mean picking up the phones and actually trying to you know get a story uh, because it's the click fast journalism um <clears throat> that is making the money online at the moment um, sadly, I mean, you only need to look at the statistics of the type, type of articles that people are clicking on en masse, you know, uh, it's easy clickbait journalism, but, um, I, I, don't, I wouldn't go so far as to say that that's not journalism. It is journalism, but it's, it's, uh, I, so I, when I talk about how fucked is journalism, I think the bar has definitely been set lower as to, as to what counts as journalism. 
and and I don't I I don't really have any problems with I don't know which, you know writing stories that people will be interested in absolutely I mean there's this whole mm-hmm. debate about public interest journalism and I was going well you know what there are things that you can write that can be of interest to the people yeah. you know what I mean yeah. and yeah. so I'm not going to take a holier than thou attitude to this look and also what about citizen journalism oh I I've I. I don't believe in that phrase. I, I just, I, I look, I mean, oh, this thing, if anyone could be a journalist now, yeah, we can all pick up a camera and talk into a camera and, and go onto social media. That doesn't make you a journalist. Uh, sorry, but it, 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 I mean, we have a code of ethics that we, we follow. We have, a, we have rules and regulations that we follow. Uh, we, we, we have to obey the law. Uh, we have to be trained in, in, um, various different aspects to do our job. So to to kind of call somebody who who picks up a camera and just walks around um, a journalist as an insult to the profession. I mean, you can't just be a citizen Garda tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You can't be a citizen judge. You can't be a citizen teacher. Uh, it is a profession. Sadly, a a, um, a a profession in decline. But I I I'm I'm quite actually. Uh, pissed off with that phrase citizen journalist i just i don't i don't buy into it at all i i'm gonna nicely pick you up on one thing i don't consider it a profession i consider it a trade and when we call it a profession i think it it speaks to the gentrification of it when i was young back in the day people became journalists at the age of 16 they didn't go to college and now you have people doing three and four year journalism degrees yeah i have you know i think if you but, speak to any reporter right mm-hmm, mm. The vast bulk of what you learn will be in the first four or five months of being a journalist, not in three years in college. Yeah, no, I, as it, you know, I didn't do a journalism degree. Mm. Uh, I, I, I have an arts degree, but yeah, no, no, I agree with all of that. But, but nonetheless, when you're a professional journalist, you know, you, you, it, it has a little bit more to it than than just being some fella off the street who's, you know, there, there, so- there, there, there is a difference. So it, I, it's it's water for ducks back for me. I always say this, anybody can call themselves a journalist and they do, but they don't do what we do. David Simon, who wrote The Wire, did you know he was a former crime reporter? Who wrote what, sorry? The Wire. Oh, The, the Wire. Yeah, Jesus, sorry. Yeah, I'm watching The yeah. Wire right now, actually. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. So yeah. he was a former crime reporter and he came mm. off the line, which was great. He said, no problem. You can all be journalists. But, you know, effectively, I don't see too many of these journalists down in the courts or in City Hall doing what we mm. do. Mm-hmm. It's all right to take up a camera, but sit down, go to the trenches, go in and report on the Jerry Hutch trial without getting yourself up for contempt of court, or go in and report on the Yosef Huska trial without getting yourself jailed. That's real yeah. journalism. That's so what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. No, that's that. That's what I'm talking about. So yeah, I've no, I've no time for that. So yeah, to, uh, in, 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 to kind of simply answer that person's question, uh, journalism is evolving. Uh, it is a shrinking uh, industry in some respects. But I also think that there will always be a want and a need for it. And I just think it's going to become more and more specialized. I think that the uh, platforms in which it's put across are going to change. People are going to maybe listen to more podcasts. There's going to be a lot more digital media as opposed to print media, which will eventually, sadly, I think, die. But it's already survived much longer than many have predicted. And I think there will always be people who want to pick up a paper too. Um, So... Yeah, I I think I might maybe get to your age before. I still think we'll have newspapers in 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 twenty years in some form. I know it's been written off mm-hmm. over the next ten years, but I still think, yeah, I still think the the, the future is there for for a good while yet. I um, I, I have one slight concern, and it's, you're right, it's about specialization. Um, the only problem is how do young hacks get to be specialists. You know, you came in, for example, you came in and you were a job and reporter for a couple of years, then your talent came through. But you had to learn. In other words, I had to give you a kick in the arse every couple of days, right? But you learn, right? Like I learned. I was never the, I'm not the finished article now, but let me tell you, in 1983 and 94, I was not the finished article. It took me, I, I, you know, I'd say it took me up until the early noughties before I felt confident in myself as a reporter. Right, It's a long process and there's so many things to learn and there's so many mistakes to make. We all make mistakes and it's the only way, in my opinion, you, you learn. You have to have, you have to be allowed to make those mistakes. Mm. Um, you have to have an employer that trusts in you. You have to have people, colleagues around you who are willing to help you as well when you're young. 
you know, not just it dismiss you because you have no skills, which is, you know, I mean, I experienced both. I, I, I did, I, I did get, you know, the cold shoulder from some people because they experienced it. They, they considered me inexperienced and didn't want to have to deal with me. Fair enough. And then, you know, I, I, when I came into the star, you, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say that I was immediately helped either, but I guess, I suppose people like yourself saw something, me a drive, in me, I suppose, and helped me. And then, you know, helped me stand on my own two feet. That's what young journalists need. They need mm. people to believe in them. But also you kind of just have to have something in you as well. I I, I, I have seen people, other people who have that drive in them. And I just know that they have, or they will have the skills to become a great journalist because they want to be. If you have that, I think that's half the battle. Um, you know, so that has to be encouraged. If someone has that kind of enthusiasm, but maybe they don't have the skills, well, they should be encouraged, uh, not pushed out of the industry. Like I think so many young people are. We talk about, we've spoken about this before, the great learning, one of the great learning experiences. Remember that time, do we want to name him? We had the story about the fella, high profile journalist, veteran journalist, do you remember? Remember you messaged him and he said, or you rang him and he said, no comment. Do you remember? Ah, yes. <laughs> right. So, but we'll go into this, right? We got a tip off that uh, somebody, are we naming him or not? Did we name him? Yeah, no, we did a story about uh, the, the great broadcaster, Vincent Brown, and this is no, right. uh, we're not maligning him here. I have great respect for Vincent Brown, but yes, we had a story in relation to his uh, being banned from driving uh, as a result of a, a number of different uh, tickets that he got from Gardaí and uh, we were going to do the story, but it was my job to contact him, uh, you know, in order to be able to name him and do the full story. We had to contact Vincent Brown. I rang him and he gave me a no comment. Um, and then you stepped so in. I remember we were all, it's, this was before COVID, so we were all in the newsroom. And I think that's one thing young journalists need a newsroom, in my opinion, just to bounce ideas off each other. And, you know, somebody could be sitting there and overhears the young hack said, oh, I remember doing a story about that in 2003. Mm -hmm. So I remember talking to you. I remember Laura Colgan was there. Sandra Mallon was there. Keith was probably there. Keith Faulkner was, but there, were, there was a good crowd of us. Anyway, so I went, I don't know, fuck this. So didn't we formulate a text message? And it was basically along the lines of, Mr. Brown, you have spent your years holding people to account and asking the, the tough questions. It is simply unacceptable for you to say no comment. And yeah. you sent it off. Yeah. And then what happened? He came back and gave me a full-fledged comment, yeah, um, confirming his drive ban. And yeah, uh, I I think he probably respected that to some mm. degree uh, and accepted that, yes, of course, he is, you know, I mean, he would expect nothing less of others himself. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, uh, but that, that was a great uh, lesson to be learned there. Um, and to be given, you know, the confidence to to don't just accept the, the, the no comment, uh, especially from someone such as him. Um but yeah, he is a great journalist and, and uh, I, I, I do appreciate that he came back to us uh, and understood, I suppose, at the time when he was on the television and he was quite well known in Irish households, why it was a story. That was great. That was a great hit. I have to say, I really, really, that was, that was excellent. That was great crack. It was, it, it, it was one of those good kind of newsroom behind the scenes stories that's, that's worth telling. And I'm sure, I'm sure even Vincent at this stage might get a laugh out yeah. of it. Okay. What's next? Uh, this is really a question for you, so I'll, I'll ask it. I, mm. I, I'd love to have your thoughts on, uh, this person says, I'd love to have your thoughts on where it actually uh, is. Sorry, I'm not reading it right. I'd love to have your thoughts on where is the rest of the Northern Bank robbery money? Reading about it at the time um, and have read as much as I can in the years since. So they're, they're wondering what happened to the money. This was in December 2004. You were probably about five at the time. And um, <laughs> I could, this shows you what, what do we know? I can remember hearing about it because it was 26.5 million pounds sterling, a uh, humongous. It was a, uh, wasn't a cash and transfer robbery, is the tiger kidnapping. One of the really, it was the biggest tiger kidnapping. They held staff and got all the money, right? And I can remember going, oh, right, because the IRA, you know, the IRA was in ceasefire and stuff. 
And I remember saying to somebody in work, oh, that was definitely the UDA, right? Well, it shows you what the fuck do I know? Anyway, very, very quickly, it became clear that it was the IRA. 26.5 million pounds. Now, here's the hunt. This questioner is asking how much money is left and where is it? They, they got effectively 10 million pounds because the Northern, I, and actually I can remember this being an order. I can remember going back up. What the Northern Bank would, had done was they minted new notes, right? And they were all stolen by the IRA. So to make them null and void, they made them, they, they reprinted other notes. So those hmm. notes were all, all had to be handed in. So they got a huge chunk of their money was made null and void. They, they couldn't use it, okay? Because it was worthless. It was paper and monocarb, polycarbon or whatever. But there were others, there were, you know, there was 10 million sterling between other uh, banknotes up north. You can have the Ulster Bank notes and Bank of Ireland and AIB, all, when it was AIB. Uh, apart from the UK British legal tender, the, the Queen. So they there's a quirk that they can print their own banknotes. Like the Royal Bank of Scotland can bin, print banknotes in Scotland, RBS. Whatever. So it was good thinking. They just collapsed two thirds of the money straight away. But then the rest of it was made up of used no, Ulster banknotes from before, from years ago, which was legal tender and legal tender from other banks, you know, British money and there may have been some euros or whatever. So it's 10 million quid. So that was an IRA thing. The guards got, the guards got a couple of million down here. Okay. Various, various operations. I'm not going to go into it, but various people were charged and that sort of thing. So you're talking 10 million. Now, I, 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 I believe that's still with the provision IRA. I don't know what they're keeping it for. Maybe they were paying volunteers a pension because that's one thing that has been said that you know this was done to give ex-volunteers who they say fought the good fight well give them money to retire and copper fasten the peace process and all that sort of stuff but there is an mm. issue I remember talking to a very senior guard about this in relation to other money laundering you have to launder the money right because the notes were all kept and everything you only get a fraction so say if you have 10 million quid to launder if you're laundering it you might get 30 cent in the euro or 40 cent in the euro. I don't think you get 50%. So mm -hmm. it's that low. So if they got 10 million pounds, I know some of it was used and undated, but a significant amount of that money will have had to have been laundered because they had the details of the banknotes. So it, although it was 10 million, it could be three or four or 5 million quid. So with a big organization like the IRA, it probably didn't last long. Yeah, it's well and truly washed now and gone. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh god, that 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 was that'll be twenty. Jesus, twenty years. That's twenty years ago in December. It was massive at the time. The IR, the Sinn Fein came under serious, serious pressure about this. Bertie Ahern went balubas. The Americans went balubas. The Brits, British went balubas about it. It was a humongous story. Very good. Uh, we have loads more questions to get through. So we we mm. have a question there. Do you want to? It's your turn, actually. Oh, right. Hold on. Uh, which one is it? Philip Kearns. Oh, yeah. Right. Sorry. So there's a young fella. Well, okay. Uh, when I was a kid, Philip Kearns went missing from Bally Road in South Dublin. It was in uh, October 1986. He just turned 13. He'd never been mm. found. There was a story in more recent times that Eamon, Eamon Cook, a notorious and convicted paedophile who died in June 2016, uh, may have brought his secrets to behind the disappearance to the grave. I, mm. I think there have been loads. It, um, you and I have covered the case. Uh, well, we know about the case of Madeleine McCann, who vanished in 2005, I think. And then, a, or was it 2007? And then in 2008, you and I covered repeatedly Amy. the case of a Amy Fitzpatrick, who disappeared in Fuengarola on the 1st of January, or was last seen on the 1st of January. This is the Madeleine McCann and the Amy Fitzpatrick story of the 80s. There's a picture of him. I think he's wearing his confirmation gear, looking really angelic. You've probably seen the pictures. It's, mm. only, it's one of the few pictures, if not the only picture. So there were lots of theories, Satanists, paedophile rings, you know, all these sort of things. And then in early 2016, a woman came forward who would have known Cook when she was very young, and she implicated Eamon Cook in this, he was a sort of pirate broadcaster, very, very well known. Mm. Mm. So he was questioned by Gardy on his deathbed. He was in St. Francis Hospice in North Dublin, 2016. And Gardy from Earth Farnham 
Tom Doyle, who was the tea sergeant, went and uh, not questioned him, I suppose, because they, they can't, they didn't arrest him, but they interviewed him and hoping that he would give a deathbed uh, confession. He did confirm that he knew uh, Philip Cairns. So yeah. really, of all the theories, and bearing in mind that Cook was a paedophile and he, he knew him, I think that, you know, effectively, who uh, has taken his secrets with him to the group, I think he is the prime suspect. Yeah, he, he kind of is the only name that's kind of cropped up that it makes any sense, I suppose. And given the fact that he admitted he knew him, and I, I think Gardy believed that he was quite close to making that confession, who sadly, mm-hmm. unfortunately, died before he could do so. But I, I think that woman, am I correct, um, had said that she had, uh, had actually seen uh, Philip Kearns uh, in his... Uh, in his company studio, and, uh, yeah. There, there, there was there was an allegation that uh, she, she, she had observed him or uh, being struck, being in in some way, um, and so look, I mean that's very significant information, but unfortunately, it's it's hard to corroborate that now in hindsight, mm-hmm. um, you know. But I think Gardy did consider that woman to be credible. Oh, she um, did. You know. They did, yeah. And and also she said that when she saw Philip being assaulted by Cook, she fainted. And when mm. she came to, she was in Cook's car and there was no mm. sign of Philip. Mm. So yeah. look, that's direct evidence. So uh, unfortunately, I think it is, he has taken his secrets to the grave. Yeah, the, the only thing is, uh, unfortunately, you know, it's like any uh, long unsolved case that has attracted many conspiracy theories. Mm-hmm. Um, there are there are also multiple other theories as to what happened to Philip Kearns. Um, I know the former detective Alan Bailey uh, always goes back to the bag that was found at the scene. And mm-hmm. I know there was DNA uh, recovered from that and it didn't match Eamon Cook. Now, that doesn't necessarily rule him out, but... Uh, it does call into question whether he was involved uh, or if somebody else was. And I know that Alan Bailey has certainly said uh, that the person who did this more than likely had uh, knowledge of the area, Raffarnham, and uh, it very much believes that it would have been a local person uh, known in the area who would be responsible for Philip's disappearance. Um, And I know that I I remember speaking to Philip's mother, um, um, I can't remember exactly how many years ago let's say three, four years ago and uh, Alice and she told me that she didn't believe that uh, and never believed that Eamon Cook was responsible um, so yeah look there are alternative theories mm. but he is definitely the strongest and only viable theory that's ever come up when you think about it Paul paedophile, convicted paedophile very very mm. dangerous man knew Philip had admitted being in his company and this witness mm. has come forward. Guards have to look at that and have to take that very, very strongly. And and they did go to him and they did ask him to say what he knew, but they did. I know. Do, um, do you, can we talk about Amy for a second? So it's 2008, so 16 years. Do you think there will ever be finality in Amy's case? Um, I, I, I worry that there won't be, um, mm-hmm. I, I, at this stage, you, you would have thought that some information would have come forward. I think of the, the recent Jay Slater case and obviously that young man, uh, turned out that he fell. He was, I mean, despite all the conspiracy theories, it was quite simple in the end, but he was found. It's quite curious that Amy was never found. Amy Fitzpatrick went missing on New Year's day in, in, in Spain in 2008, um, and despite multiple theories as to what happened to her, she's her, 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 you know, if she has been killed, her, her remains, or, or if she just died in tragic circumstances, it's, it, it's very strange that her remains have never been recovered. Uh, all these years later, um, now I think sadly it, it's too, too little too late. Now there are obviously individuals who know what happened to her. Um, um, but, but do they have a conscience? Have they, are they ever going to come forward? It, they probably should have by now. Um, I often, I often yeah. wonder about that. Do 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 does conscience ever get the better of people? Do you remember mm. uh, a man walked into Store Street and said he'd been involved in a murder, and then he he, he later took his own. I won't say who he is, but he later took his own life. Yeah, and he said he'd been involved in a murder. So I, I've often wondered about why don't more people do that. Mm. Yeah, and it's a curious case, and and we should do a pod on it someday. But yeah, I mean, lots of people. 
think they know what happened and they've kind of made assumptions. And I think as a result of that, it's gone nowhere. The Spanish police have said all about it and the investigation is effectively closed. Um, I think there needs to be a new investigation starting from scratch as to what happened to Amy Fitzpatrick. And I really hope uh, it's actually one of those cases uh, that really bothers me. And I, I would love to see the day that it is solved uh, you know, for her family's sake, uh, to to know exactly what happened to her and who's responsible, not just to have theories about it and everybody go, oh, it was such and such, to actually know uh, w would would be fantastic. But I I doubt it at this stage whether it'll ever be solved. I hope. I often I often think about it. I mean, and 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 I would say we pray for. Her. I remember during the Jay Slater case. Do you remember all the ravines and everything? Mm. They were searching. I was over in Fuengarola and Calahonda when Amy went missing. And I can remember she walked from a friend's house, Isley Rubio over, and it was a shortcut, but it was through a ravine and the, this Guardia Civil were searching it. And when I saw that stuff about Jay Slater, I just, I just thought about Amy a lot okay. because it, it's very deep ravines. Now they searched it with helicopters and everything and sniffer dogs and they found leggings and they thought they were hers, but they weren't, but they, there was a massive search for her. So she's not in that ravine. She's not there. So mm. I, I, I'd like some finality. I have to say, I, I know the parents would. I just think, uh, had she died in circumstances like Jay Slater, her body would have been found. Mm. Uh, it wasn't. Um, I, I, I do believe she was murdered, uh, until proven otherwise. And somebody out there knows uh, what happened to her. But uh, we haven't really been asked about that. We're, we, we should definitely, we're, we will dive into that on another mm -hmm. day. Um, we've got a question now. It's my turn, actually. Mm -hmm. um, can't say some of this, but no. I will paraphrase it. Uh, why are uh, the family and Mr. Big allowed to wholesale drugs? Is it because there is a low body count as they prefer to threaten or inflict injury instead of shooting? Is that acceptable? Well, is, uh... there's well, in relation to Mr. Big, it's far from a low body count. I remember, I, as I said, mm -hmm. thinking that, you know, it's 16, maybe 15 or 16 murders that his gang have been involved in. You know, Robbie Lawler, for example, uh, mm -hmm. Alan Ryan, you know, there is a significant number of people who have been murdered by Mr. Big. Now, the quest, so the question said, why are they allowed to do this? They're not. The, no. the family are, in Ireland, the family are the biggest target for the Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau and, you know, all the Garda alphabet soup units. There are significant operations underway constantly. Do you remember... Uh, I remember there was a fella caught with several million euro worth of cash. He was transporting it down the country. That belonged to the family. Do you remember that big, the big drug seizure there uh, in, at the Abbey, uh, airport in Abu Shrew? Yes. Was 11 also million. The family. Yeah. The family. And the belief was that this had been a major route for them. So there are mm. significant resources being put in to the family and to Mr. Big. I mean, mm. we have done stories, say, about the investigation into Robbie Lawler that. Mr. Property linked to Mr. Big was searched at the end of July. So, you know, they're going after him. And this is why in the previous part I was asked who would like to interview. Mr. Big has survived. Mm -hmm. And it's not for want of trying. The guards have gone after him big time. But they haven't really landed a knockout punch. Yeah, and the family too uh, are responsible for murders. They are connected to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the recent murder of Gary the Canary Gary, for example, mm. um, you know, so yeah, it, uh, it's not that these people are being allowed to act with impunity. Uh, they're certainly not. It's just that, unfortunately, the investigations into them are complex and they take time. Uh, one of the members of the family, referring to them as the family, has been recently before the courts in relation to another matter. Uh, so they are pursuing them. And that person is a senior member of the family gang as well. Um, so it's not like they're getting away with it. And... You know, and I always go back to this. I remember in late 1999, early 2000, early 2000, actually, I interviewed the then Garda Commissioner, Pat Byrne. Mm. And I was working for the Irish News in Belfast. And it was obviously there were northern elements that we were interested in. It was about Duma Bomb, right? And uh, he said, Duma Bombers may never be caught. And he was right, because they haven't. 
But he said one thing that has always stuck with me. There's a difference between us knowing something and proving it. Guards can have great intelligence. They can have all this sort of stuff. But unless they can get it across the line to the DPP satisfaction firstly, and then to a jury or three judges in the special, then nothing's mm. going to happen. So they know Mr. Big is involved in this. They know the family are involved in this. But you've got to prove it, sunshine. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, I've got to be careful here, but Mr. Big, you know, they have gone after him before. And um, he has gone through the legal system before mm. and he emerged from his unscathed. So, yeah, they'll go after him again when they have the evidence. And as you mentioned, the murder of Robbie Lawler, now they are looking at him and his gang in relation to that. Um, so, like, yeah, the premise of the question, I suppose, is probably not really fair. Uh, Gardy are doing all they can. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, a couple of recent drug seizures in relation to the family. The reason why we call them the family, in case anyone's not heard us talk about that before, uh, like this person actually named them. A lot of people know who they are. Uh, I mean, it's like the Kinnahans. I mean, they're quite quite notorious. But yeah, look, these people don't have enough convictions to their name uh, for us to be able to refer to them by name. They would sue us. Um, you can probably name them on social media, but I can't. Um, so uh, look, we have to be careful, but there will come a day if and when these people are ever convicted, they will be named and shamed. Well, I was going to say, well, we leave it there for today because that's, that's a good half hour and I think... Possibly is. Yeah, we, we're getting so much out of your questions. Right. We're getting multiple podcasts. So thank you very much. And uh, talk to you next week.